what can you say about the figure? Because Nigerians are really uh, many, many, many Nigerians. Let me put it that way. They are really not um, believing those figures. What do you have to say about the figures? Well, the figures are what they are, right? Um, uh, whether they are accurate or not, it's maybe I'll share my perspective around it. But first of all, uh, like I mentioned earlier, there are. The country has recognized methods of making a confirmatory diagnosis of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So meaning that uh, before a case is reported officially and formally, then such a person, such a diagnosis would have been made using such, such methods, mm -hmm. uh, and which I, I mentioned earlier. And um, so what that invariably means is that uh, you have to necessarily test people mm -hmm. before you can make a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. and you know, in principle, uh, the more people you test, okay, uh, the more people you are likely to find. Um, uh, we do know that it's possible to make testing very targeted so that you can increase the yield. Okay, you know, but currently, we do know that the country, I mean, as of today, uh, which is the second of August, yeah. uh, the country has done uh, cumulatively about two hundred and eighty-three. Thousand uh, COVID nineteen tests, okay. uh, which some people consider, uh, uh, you know, really on the low side. If you take into account that this condition has been with us now for almost six months, yeah. and also if you take into account the fact that the country has a population of two hundred million people, yeah, and yeah. virtually and every state the, is the, affected. The, the, the ratio is you know, very, yeah. very so low, yeah. so we are looking at a situation where, you know, out of two hundred million, we've only tested. Uh, 280 something thousand, uh, which is, you know, like uh, uh, well, maybe one test for every 1,000 person, which is really, really very low. But however, you know, this this test, this number of tests has yielded, you know, as of today, you know, about uh, 43,500 cases cumulatively uh, over time. And um, which gives a positivity rate of about 15 percent that means that 15 out of every 100 persons okay. tested has turned out to be positive, positive. which is quite high okay. you know which is really quite high um, and also which uh, probably suggests that if we had found a way of testing many more people you know if we uh, i know at some point ncdc uh, announced a, an ambitious plan to test two million people over a three months period which would have been quite remarkable if we found a way of achieving that. So imagine if we did that over a three months period, in the last three months, for example, and we had a positivity rate of, you know, fifteen percent or even ten percent, then we probably would have a case count through that approach of over two hundred thousand. You know, so yes, there are concerns that we probably are not testing enough, okay. and that the figures, yes, quite high, but maybe if we are tested more, we probably would have officially higher figures of people with COVID-19 um, uh, but that is for the government to resolve to find a way of, uh, of uh, ramping up testing okay. so that we can come we can have uh, you know close to accurate estimates of the real prevalence of the condition okay. but it's also uh, important to note that you know for since we are talking about the statistics that out of the about 43,500 people who have cumulative tested positive so far. You know, about uh, 20,000 of, of these have been successfully managed okay. and discharged and, uh, you know, literally declared free of COVID-19, okay. while you have about 22,000 something that are still active cases. Okay. And it's also important to note that uh, Lagos State, you know, has been the epicenter and accounts for almost 40% of the total number of cases yeah. in the country. Um, uh, but also, interestingly, Lagos State has conducted more than 40% of the total number of tests. So yes, there's, a, there's a correlation between <laughs> testing and cases. So yeah, if you, yeah, if yeah, you yeah, test like, more, yeah, yeah, you, you are get, likely to find more. more, you know? more so sure, that's, yeah. so that's, uh, that's a principle that is really very important that okay. uh, we actually need to do more. The, 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 the hallmark you know, of, of the response is your ability to rapidly test, you know, detect, okay. 
isolate yes. and treat. You know, if you if we are able to do that in a very proficient manner and we're able to do it at scale, okay. then we will increase our chances of yes. being able to manage the condition yes. and being able to uh, eventually defeat and beat the the, the, the virus. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, doctor. Yeah. Let okay. Me so I'm so sorry to now just okay. before you go. Okay. Uh, we also do know that. Um, uh, the country has also recorded, you know, uh, over 800 deaths yeah, yeah, uh, cumulatively yeah, yeah, yeah. over the period as of today, which is, again, on the high side, but uh, there's a belief out there that if we are not testing enough, then there probably may have been uh, COVID-19 related mortality in some people who were not tested. Yeah. And uh, as such, such deaths could not be attributed to COVID-19. So yeah, there's a perception that the actual mortality may be a lot higher. Yeah, 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 and uh, just to conclude on this, um, recently a study was done by the Center for Disease Control in the US, an antibody test. You know, I mentioned antibody, which yeah. uh, is able to tell if somebody may have had the infection, whether or not they knew about it. Okay. And um, uh, this, this study showed that um, in, in you know, I think it was in New York and some other places, you know, that, um, you know, that for post potentially for every reported case of COVID-19, there may be up to 10 cases that go unreported. <laughs> and if you consider that the U.S. Uh, yeah. the U.S. has done more tests than any country in the world, the U.S., you know, as of today, has done over 50 million 50 wow. million tests. That, that, yeah, yeah, has done almost uh, 50 million tests and found more than, you know, four about 4.5 million cases okay. out there about, you know, compared to Nigeria that has done just 280 something thousand tests. So if in a country like the US that has done so many tests but still believe that they are not testing enough, still believe that for every one case, mm -hmm. you know, there's about 10 mm -hmm. that goes undetected. So they, there is a chance that a similar picture is playing out in other places or even worse, yeah. you know, especially in countries that are not testing enough. So. The figures are what they are. Okay. They are, they are, they are accurate in the sense that they are a reflection of the effort so far. Okay. So the question is that is there a lot more beyond that, that based okay. on the effort that has not carried out, based on the fact that we're not testing enough? Is there a chance that there might be in reality many more, more cases, cases okay. and many more deaths? And okay. I strongly believe that that is likely to be the case. Okay. So now, do we have a, a vaccine, and what is the hope of getting a vaccine yeah. very soon? Because what we all are, what we are waiting for now is, um, is a vaccine. Yes. And, um, okay, so let me start by saying that vaccine development processes are really, really very complex. Okay. Very, very complex. And um, vaccines for viruses especially are even more complex compared to, you know, some bacterial conditions. Yeah. Uh, we do know that um, uh, HIV, for example, has been the, around uh, uh, for long. close to, uh, that's 1981, this is uh, close to 40 years, and, no cure yet. and uh, there's no vaccine <laughs> <laughs> yet, despite all the research. Um, Ebola, uh, which had been around for far longer, uh, over 40 years as well, it's only recently that uh, uh, we can say that there's a vaccine. And, uh, even that is still undergoing evaluation and all of that. Okay. Um, there are some vaccines for, I mean, for example, influenza, which has similar symptoms as, as COVID-19. Okay. You know, vaccines have been successfully developed for it. And it's, it's quite challenging because of the constantly mutating nature of, of the yeah. influenza virus. Okay. You know, but for COVID-19, it's important to note that no disease condition in the history of humanity has received as much attention and as much funding for vaccine development as much as COVID-19. Billions of dollars are, have been spent already and are being spent just because of uh, uh, the, the nature of the condition and the potential threat it has on human existence, both health-wise and also on the economy um, yeah. as well, and how it has disrupted yeah. you know, our lives and, uh, as, and, and, and uh, you know, making it almost impossible to experience life as normal as we used to know it in the past. You know, so uh, it's interesting to know that there are, you know, probably over 200 different vaccine development efforts around the world. And up to 20 of those 
are showing sign of, of promise. Okay. You know, haven't scaled through different phases. You know, there's phase one, there's phase two, you know, then there's human trials okay. uh, at a low scale, then there's, you know, a large scale human trial before uh, it's, you can conclude the vaccine development process. Typically, vaccine development, you know, lasts up to five years at the minimum. But do we have five years to wait for COVID-19 vaccine? <laughs> no, we don't. The world is in a race yeah. to get one. And um, it's important to announce that um, at least, you know, three countries, the US, um, China, Russia, and the UK, uh, as well as Germany, at least five countries have uh, have announced at least one vaccine candidate okay. that has really reached advanced stages of, um, of, of clinical trials. Okay. And have commenced human trials, some mm -hmm. have completed phase one of the human trials mm -hmm. and going into phase two, you know, and then um, preliminary reports from, you know, from the researchers behind this uh, suggests uh, some promising outcomes uh, from the trials that have been conducted so far. And then um, it is believed that, uh, you know, further evaluation and testing will be required before we can come to that point where we believe that we have a safe vaccine that can be developed at scale. You know, several dates have been counted. Some people have said that before the end of the summer, okay. you know, which is, you know, around September, October, people have, have uh, advanced that as a time when perhaps maybe some of the trials will be concluded. Some people have said maybe sometime early next year. Okay. But it's also important to note that um, having a vaccine that has been successfully tried is one thing. Being able to produce it in enough quantities and to <laughs> administer it to as many people who need it around the world is something else entirely. Wow. You know, the world population is over 7 billion. Yeah. And uh, uh, what that means is that if you were to even if we had the technology to 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 develop um, and be able to administer a vaccine to develop let's say for example 10 million doses of a vaccine every day right it will take several years before you can produce enough quantities to go around everybody administer enough quantities to go around everybody you know so uh, on the one hand it's good to know that the vaccine development process is progressing, exactly. but on the other hand, we need to be cautiously optimistic uh, over the eventual outcome of the vaccine development process on the one hand, and, and, and also over the reality of how extremely difficult it will be you know, to produce sufficient quantities that could go around everywhere. And for those of us in the, in the third world, we also have this added layer of having to wait until it is our turn because uh, I want to believe that the rich nations and the nations who are behind this research will prioritize their population okay. you know, in, the, in the first set of the vaccines that are developed. And um, it's likely to come at a huge cost that might be very difficult for a lot of countries. So that, 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 that point now you just made um, I, um, actually brought something to my mind now. Like, um, is there anything political about the, the vaccine itself? Because um, I, I was discussing with a um, doctor yesterday in Yekon, and he was telling me that um, the possibility of the country that developed the virus becoming the next world power is there. So I don't know what yeah, you I have mean, to say about, yeah, of, about of that. Of course, yeah. they, 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 it's, they it's like a good mind. Yes, and it is. It is. Uh, you know, there's a... Uh, there's, uh, there's, a, there's been an ongoing scientific race, and don't, don't forget, very recently there was this war uh, over 5G and who yeah. was going to take the credits okay. and glory yeah, okay. for uh, developing and advancing 5G technology because of the potential. Okay. You know, so there's a, like a tech war generally. Between um, I welcome you all to Koromi Channel. Today we are here in Badagri, this next point, to know more about what happened when our forefathers were taken out of the country. So I'm here and here we go.
they slept here but so my name is Abiodu Mobi. So we talk in charge Mobi Slavery Museum in Badagui. Okay. So in Badagui here we we have a lot of tourist attraction. Okay. Number one we have the, the, the slave relics museum which is where we are now. Okay. Number two and in the slave relics museum that's where you're gonna see the sharp issues on slave and the days of slave trade. Okay. After that we have the first story building in Nigeria's work. Okay. We have uh, the slave barracoon where the slave have been kept in the days of slave trade. Okay. We have an heritage museum, slave market. So Badagui. Badagui was founded 1425 and the slave trade started in Badagui 15 centuries ago. Okay. So the trade lasted for good 400 years in Badagui before it was abolished. And all these environments used as a slave corridor. So slave was brought from outside Badagui, from interland, okay. like Oyo, Ushubu, Abeokuta, Ibadan, Ondo, you know, different places like that. Okay. And during the days of slavery, we have two coasts okay. in Nigeria. In Nigeria. Okay. We have one in Calabar. Okay. The one in the Calabar called the Anyong Slave Market. Okay. You know, and the market was established in 1810. In each market day in Calabar, I think 100 slaves have been sold in a day. Wow. 100 human beings have been sold every market day. Now, here in Padago, we have Veliquete Slave Market, which is V L E K E T E. Veliquete Slave Market was established 1502 here in Padago. It was been found before the Calabar one. So, this one was the first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In each market here in Padago, 300 slaves have been sold in a day. So and that of Calabar. Yeah, so 17,000 slaves sold annually. And this trade we're talking about lasted for good 400 years in Badagui. Uh, so, this place happened to be the way out of our brother and sister in diaspora. Okay. So, let's proceed. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Chapels, Jews of slave during the days of slave trade. And a slave is a person captured and sold out in exchange to work under the of his masters. Here we have original chain used on slave during the era of slavery. And this chain was brought here by the white men to here around 15 centuries ago, roughly five to 600 years now. These very shackles that you're seeing here. At my right side here, here we have the grave of someone, which is Chief Sungu Mobi. The man died naturally. His name is Chief Sungu Mobi, he died October 16, 1893. So during his own time, slavery stopped in Badagui, 1886, after the trade lasted 400 years. And Chief Sungu Mobi's father eventually participated during the days of slave trade. His own nickname, Mobi, by the white men, because Kolanot was called Obi in Yoruba. And majority of Badagui indigenous here, we are all migrated from down men, now Benin Republic. So whenever the white people came to buy slave, Chief Sungu Mobi's father always offered them with the Kolanot, spoke to them in our own dialect. Hontoshi, Miya Viro, means my white friends take cola nut and eat. Why his own name is very difficult for the white people to pronounce, they said calling him Mobi, 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 Mobi. So that's where the name Mobi derived from. When, when, when his father died, the one that we survived his father, he took over after the death of his father, while the missionary came in. So he got to work with the missionary and slavery stopped through him in 1886. Okay. And this is the chief traditional staff of office during his lifetime. Whenever the chief want to go out, one of his daughter will hold this. That is their own tradition. Checking it. So whoever hears the noise, they know that the chief is going out. If it is man, she made this on the way. Man will prostrate, woman will kneel down. That shows a sign of respect to the chief there. So at my next side here, we call this the neck lock. Each slave has this around the neck, like this. Late MPO Abiola, he was here around 1991. Okay. That is during the reparation campaign. That time, Abiola is fighting for reparation. I want the white people to compensate against we black and say sorry for slavery. But unfortunately, he died during the process. So any slave and to the white men, they have these chains. They don't neck like this. Wow. Our brothers and sisters in diasporas, father, 
forefather they have suffered. So another person will have his own, and they'll be on the road, and the chain will be around you know, the neck like this for good 18 good hours every day. Wow. They're using the menaces up to relax. After fixing these, they're on soul's neck. This was fixed on two people's leg, as in one person's leg here, another person's leg here. They lock it to padlock, and two of them continue working, going at the same time at once. Wow. This use of stubborn slave who refuse to work on farm. The force is held by force, up to his wrist. They remove this knot, hang the person up on a very tall tree with one hand, while his two legs will be dangling punishment for the stubborn slave. Uh -huh. This use on children to so guide their babies not to disturb their parents while working on to became So children were also slaves. Yeah, they are also sold as slaves. They, they packed their children too. Wow. So they have to join two or three kids together like this. The lockdown padlock while their parents busy working on the farm. Uh -huh. So this use on slave mouth to guide them not to eat or to talk to the one another while working on chicken plantation. This was used for three purposes. The first purpose is to put this object into a fire when it is very, very red hot. They used to make a whole here. Wow. Can you imagine that? It will be put up and down, hmm. lips like this. After that, they now fix this. On the mouth. They draw the lips out very well. They lock it padlock like this or like that. It will guide them not to eat or to talk to the one another while working on sugar cane plantation. The second purpose of using these objects, very small, but it's mighty. The second purpose of using this, any slave trying to run away, or any slave rebel against white, there is this part to punch his foot, as in his foot will be on top of the falling tree in the farm like this, and then nail it down. Wow. So if you watch a movie called The Root, that is Kintakunte movie, okay. you know what I'm talking about. Try to watch it. The third purpose of using this slave, slave has name that they are bearing by those white people. They are so callous. They don't allow slave to bear their name. They bear the master's name, which is their own name. Okay. They put this object into a fire when it is very red hot. They use it to write the name of their masters and their master's nationality at the back of their slave. So that when they go back to their own destination, they can be able to identify which slave is this. So, this is called cannon gun. The guns stand as time during the days of slave trade, shot three times in a day. They are not to show this cannon. Gunpowder goes through this hole. They light this small hole with a fire and the cannon will explode. The first shot of this cannon, hearing in the morning, signified that they were taking the slave down to the farm to walk, which is across of this water. Okay. Second one in the afternoon, they have been arrived from the farm down to where the money kept them called the Brazilian slave barracoon. You see, that barracoon is a Brazilian word. It means jail cell or prison okay the third shot of this cannon signify a curfew everybody in this pedigree must remain indoors anybody caught after the touch shooting have to face the consequences mainly so out into slavery because during the holding days all this environment used as a slave corridor so slaves used to spend like three months within this environment before the white people ship them away to the new world to the places like cuba jamaica west indies brazil America, you know, different places like that. So this is the money spent in those days, which is cowries. Mm. Cowries, we, we recognize cowries within ourselves in Africa as money, but the white people, they couldn't recognize cowries as money. In order for them to buy slave, they practice trade by butter. Okay. So they have to brought this like gun, gunpowder, and iron, cotton, mirror, umbrella. In the exchange of human beings, so like then, a bottle of whiskey like this in the exchange of 10, Hebrew men, 10 slaves. So this one is able to give yes. you 10, 10, yes. 10 men? Yes. Wow. So, right here, this is where the slaves normally have their drinking water, called the, the slave drinking water bowl. When the slave arrive from the farm, they feel out water, they tie their hands back, open their mouth lock, with heavy chains around the neck, and as them to bend down here, they drank like hand mouths, no call. So let's thank God that we are not yet born during the days of slave trade. So, here we have a royal musical instrument found in royal families here in Badagri called a jogan. Whenever king of Badagri or chiefs of Badagri have any ceremony, 
women use this as in women we hold a stream pulling they'll be singing in our own dialect which is ogu singing you know singing dancing making melodious sound to the king of the musical instrument why some of the women will hold these gongs beating it so you have a different sound So, if I hand me here, we have a status. Talks about stubborn castrated slave begging for forgiveness. The world looked very, very horrible. You see, during the days of slave trade, some of the white people settled down here in Badagri with some of their families. So, okay. And then we have two categories of slave. We have the feed slave and we have the domestic slave. Okay. So the white people use some of the male slave at home, like a domestic slave. Okay. So in order for such slave to have sexual intercourse with their wife or daughter, they do castrate them. Okay. So that is to say, they do castrate some of the male slave during the era of slavery. Okay. So here we have the paintings of a tree. The name of this tree called the historical Agia tree. It was called the historical assessor tin Agia tree. This as a certain means Agia, which is Baragri, um, um, our own dialect, okay. as a certain, which is Ogun. So, under the shadow of this very tree, Christianity was first preached in the whole Nigeria here, Badagri, in the year 1842 by Thomas Beck Freeman and Henry Townsend. And the first Christmas service in Nigeria was celebrated under the shadow of the, the very tree. So, the tree later fell down 1959. And before the tree fell, it spent up to 350 years. There was a monument there today that represents the, the tree. So, and this is how the slavery was eradicated in different parts of the world. Slavery stopped in the British West Indies, 1833, Australia, 1861, United States of America, 1863, Brazil, 1888, Africa, 1870, Badagri, 1886. After the tree lasted 400 years. And finally, we have a picture that shows the first story building in Nigeria, built 1845. By Reverend C. A. Goldman. Inside this building, the African free slave boy, Reverend Bishop Samo Ajayi Crowder. Ajayi sat down here and translated English Bible into Yoruba. And the Bible that he translated is still there up to date. I think that is all what we have for you in this museum. You are welcome. Thank you very much. So this symbolizes how those slaves were been working on sugarcane plantation. Atlantic slaves working in sugarcane plantation. So this is how they work during the days, during the era of slavery. And on the floor there, we have a big canoe. This canoe This canoe was brought in exchange of 100 slaves, which is each of these canoe was brought in exchange of 100 human beings. It was brought to wage war and to get more slaves. Why 50 people cannot lift it up now? That during the days of slave trade, 10 slaves can lift it up. Wow. So it was made of melter. Why 50 people don't lift it up? Is this two carol? That's 200 human beings. Let's go. So, you are welcome back. Thank you very much. So, here we are now called the, the slave port. So, the slave port in Badagi was established in the 16th to 18th centuries. So, during the days of slave trade, when those white people had a signal, and the big ships arrived from the high sea. They marched those slaves from the barrack, which is where the slaves have been kept. Yeah, yeah, so they marched them from the barrack down to the space. They were heavy chains around the neck, wide their mouth, and their neck with love to see So they marched them down there. So, they, you know, that time, not like these people, they used to you know, have the barrack here. They marched them, march them over there, and then they were going to move inside the field. That's how they were going to move inside. But they got to the other side, they line them up, the chain will be on the left, the mountain will be on the left, that's the thing that's going to be on the island. So, there's an island there. Yes, to the seashore. Which is, I think, they're still going to be on the island. To the seashore. But on their way going, there was a well on the road, called, the name of the well called, Atenuation Well. And they got to that spot, most of the people are going to be on the road. After taking the well, they see the first.
What is so special about it? came to Badagui, was given a title called Seriki, and Seriki means head of Muslims. So that's why the man is wearing Seriki with the Abbas. So when this man came to Badagui, he also went back to the state where he was captured. He found it to towns in the state. He found it at 1902. When you get to 1902, you will see the status of the man at the roundabout in 1902. Also found a town called Idogo. Also in Ogun State. So I'll talk about the bar later. These are some European products they use in the airport of state. In Nigeria, then the spring carries. And the white people cannot use our own money. And that's why they prefer to bring some items they use in the exchange of slaves. A value of an umbrella, 40 slaves. If you can have one umbrella, you will need to produce 40 able men. 40 yeah. able men. Yeah. Wow. Still have one of the umbrella in our museum up to date. A bottle of gin, 10 slaves. A big can of gold, 100 slaves. Why the small can of gold, 40 slaves. Ketu and the bay and the brass dish are the items given to Seriki by the Brazilians as a And Nino doesn't have a specific number. It depends how you can bargain with white people. Ceramic gold, 10 slaves. It can go 40 slaves. The slaves. And this chain is called heavy chain. Heavy chain is meant for the stubborn slaves. Why this one is called Akuchakuri? So this object is called iron drilling beads. An iron drilling bead, they use it to write their name at the back of their slaves in order for them to identify their slaves Anytime they want to use it, it will be very, very hot. And during that period, most of the slaves died because they cannot bear the pain. So 40 people are coming to this room. 40? Yeah. 40 people were killed in this inner room before the arrival of the ship. They feed them once in a day. This is where they wee wee and this is where they poo poo. You can imagine how this place will be messed up there. 40 people? Yeah. And this is the only ventilation you have in the room. And that's why most of the slaves died because of the heat and the odor. A gramophone record used by Seriki then. And this is one of the bottles of gin they brought there. A brass dish cup and mock up given to the man by the Brazilians as a gift. And this is the money they use in Nigeria that they carry. So these are some bowls they use in the exchange of slaves. The value of one boat, 10 slaves. So anybody that needs the five boat, we need to produce 50 slaves. So these are some local made pots used by Seriki then. This is a water pot and this is a soup pot. Why this one also a water pot? Our people shouldn't have done what they did to our black brothers. Yeah, yeah. Don't you think somehow that our yeah, yeah. Okay. Our, they, 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 our own people too also contributed sure, somehow? Sure, 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 sure. Okay. Well, no, when I explain to, to foreign people, me too, I feel full years. See, you understand? I feel full years. I feel so bad. We are here in Badagri, we are heading towards the point of no return where the slaves have been taken. And after they cross this side, they are We are here now to take. Return from where they take the slave, from here they take them to the point of no return. We are heading there now, but it's no longer called the point of no return because people go there now. Come back. We are now on our journey to the point of 
don't return. We are our forefathers. We are, they, we are taking to the point that they got to, and when they get there, they can't come back again to Nigeria. From there, they are taking away. So we are going to that point now. But modernization and civilization has made it that it is no longer a point of no return. It is now a point of return because people go there and now return. So we too, we are going and we are going to return. So from here, many of them do not know where they went, where they landed. Don't I bring? Just be like me. And they not get to the other side. Do not be. Uh, what are we doing here? Horrible experience, very, very horrible. That our own people, we have to sell their own brothers and sisters out for slavery, and even support them with African magic. And that time, before the Atlantic slave trade, eh? yeah, we have our own. We have our own domestic slave, okay, which is, and uh, that time. Being a, 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 a local chief, okay. if they want to know how well how healthy is you, wealthy, yeah, wealthy, okay, they will know through your slave the number of slaves you I have. I call it Iwafa, okay, in Yoruba, okay. Aha, uh -huh. so now the white people they have their own to bear, they call them red Indians, okay, and they are no more stronger than. So they manage themselves and move on to the mainland over there. Okay. So being the first time of our people seeing the white people, the slave spirit, attenuation. Well, wow. Why taking our brothers and our sisters in diaspora to ensure? Okay. They on their way coming, you know, some of them will be feeling tasty. Okay. So they stop them here. And they force them to drink out of this well. Okay, they drink from this. Yeah, called attenuation well. They took out of this well, they drank out of this well, and they lost their memory. Okay. They look less aggressive until they get to white people country before they be sub submissive. So was there something like a magic inside the yeah, water? Yeah, the magic, African concussion, um, in conjunction with the local chief and the white people. Okay. I think they put something inside because we took the lab, the, the water to the lab, okay. and we discovered that there's something inside. So this is the tunnel.
welcome. Thank you. When the march to clear from the lagoon shore over there down to the seashore here. The march there through this door. Okay. The tunnel. Okay. So why do you the big ship in the middle of the sea? Because it can't come down. It can't come down at the shallow. So they had a signal that the big ship was on the ice. Arrive, march them from here down. Okay. The chain will be around the neck, the amount will be cliffs. Okay, they march them down from here. Come directly from here. They come through here and they march them down. Okay. Um. So why are we them? Don't be seen the This is the tunnel where our ancestors, our African brothers and sisters, this is where they were kept while awaiting the European ships to take them out of the country. It is the point of no return. So when they get to this point, they are no longer coming back. Because from here, they see directly here, through the airport of the canoe, they get to the middle of the ocean and so end the history of so many of our black brothers and sisters. So end their recognition of where they came from, the point of no return. This is the channel where the tunnel where they were kept. Human beings were kept here to be taken out of Africa. Indeed, a big one. As you can see so they mark them right from. The well and they enter through this direction. Why they wait for the ship that will take them? Good afternoon, viewers. I welcome you to Word of Life with Padre Okoromi Paul. Today I will be discussing a very fundamental topic that is affecting all humanity at the moment. And what topic am I simply talking about? I am talking about the Corona virus. I have here with me in the studio an expert in this field who has been to major television station in Nigeria, Chinese television to discuss this topic. 
he loves discussing this topic. So that's why I have to invite him around today so that he can enlighten us about the COVID-19. I welcome to the studio, Dr. Emeka Anoje. Thank you very much, Father. My pleasure. You're welcome. Yeah. So today we are talking about the coronavirus. What is coronavirus <laughs> and COVID-19? What, okay. what is it all about? Okay. So let me start by, uh, well, first of all, thank you. And um, like you mentioned in your introductory remark, uh, the world is facing unprecedented times. You know, one of the biggest challenges as a, as a global community we're facing, okay. perhaps since the Second World War. Okay. And um, what is expected of us this period is to get to know about this challenge. Okay. Uh, the more we know about it, the better we're able to combat it. Yeah, no. And um, I'm glad you've created this opportunity to enlighten your, your viewers about COVID-19 and coronavirus. Yeah. Okay, so I will start first of all by uh, describing viruses generally, okay. you know. So viruses are microorganisms, microbes that okay. causes disease in okay. the body. Okay. And there are several types of such microbes. I mean, viruses is one of them. Okay. You also have bacteria, okay. you have parasites, yeah. you have fungus okay. or, uh, that causes fungal infection. So virus broadly speaking, are microbes that cause diseases or okay. illness in the body. Then coronavirus uh, specifically is a family okay. of viruses. That okay. means a subset of viruses, okay. um, which are RNA viruses. Okay. And um, this, this, they are called, they are so called because of the way they are shaped, okay. you know, like a crown. They have spikes of glycoproteins okay, okay, that okay. Yeah. project from a spherical core, okay. giving it a crown-like appearance, okay, okay, hence okay. the name coronavirus. Okay, okay. There have been, there are several types of coronavirus and okay. in existence, um, but historically only three have had uh, significance with respect to disease. Okay. The first one, uh, in the year 2002, okay. uh, there was an outbreak uh, of uh, a disease condition that was caused by coronavirus, which okay. at that time, uh, the disease condition was named Severe Acute Respiratory uh, Syndrome, okay. Syndrome SARS. SARS. Okay. And the virus at that time was called SARS-CoV. Okay. It was a coronavirus. Wow. Uh, that outbreak lasted about two years, and by 2014, it was resolved. And since 2014, there has been no reported case wow. of SARS-CoV. Okay. Uh, about 10 years later, uh, about 2012 or thereabouts, okay. there was also another outbreak okay. caused by a coronavirus, yeah, this time okay. around in the Middle East. The first one SARS was in China okay. uh, and, and Asia. Okay. So this one uh, was called Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. Okay. Again, uh, it was contained within a year or two wow. and it largely did not spread outside of the Middle East. Okay. Uh, but currently now, we have yet another outbreak, wow. but this time around in a it's bigger way, proportion, yeah. uh, which, is caused, which causes severe acute respiratory syndrome, okay. uh, much similar to SARS in 2002, and the virus this time around has been called SARS-CoV-2. Remember the first one okay. was SARS-CoV, okay. and this time around is SARS-CoV-2 oh, because it's a different variant oh, of, of the virus that okay. that, that okay. caused uh, of the coronavirus that caused um, that caused the condition in 2002. Okay. However, this time around, um, this current outbreak was first reported in Wuhan, China, in 2019. Okay. And. Um, and since then it has spread and currently has virtually affected every single country in the world and every continent. And um, the WHO um, had to declare it a global pandemic, pandemic. on okay. account of the massive spread okay. of the condition okay. around the okay. world. Now, the disease it causes, so the virus itself is called SARS-CoV-2. Okay. However, the disease it causes okay. was for the purpose of scientific nomenclature and uniformity, uh, it was described or labeled or called COVID-19. That means okay. coronavirus okay. disease. And okay. The appellation of 19 was in Is recognition it, of a okay. time okay. when okay. it's yeah, okay. 2000. yeah, 2019, okay. when the outbreak first uh, was reported in China. Okay. 
So in summary, um, coronaviruses are, are viruses, a family of viruses in, in the body that has an affinity okay. for attacking the respiratory system of the body. Okay. And um, uh, by so doing, they cause a, a variety of symptoms which we will get into, I'm sure, in your subsequent questions. Sure. And the disease they cause is called COVID-19. Okay. So thank you very much, Doctor, for that introduction. So now, we, uh, we now know what the virus is, yeah. that um, now we are just calling it coronavirus, coronavirus. Mm. There is something other than, yeah, than exactly. that. So now, like how long um, is the incubation period for COVID-19? And what are the symptoms of COVID-19? Okay. okay, so generally, like I mentioned, uh, coronavirus, uh, COVID-19 has uh, affinity for the respiratory system. Okay. And, uh, Typically, exposure um, occurs by uh, someone who inhales infected uh, respiratory dro droplets from an infected person, okay. or uh, the person touches the, the surface that is contaminated and inadvertently touches his eyes, his nose, or his mouth with the virus and it finds its way into the, the system. Okay. Uh, so, that contact, you know, between an individual and the virus is called an exposure. Okay. You know, so, uh, so in terms of your question, how long after an exposure? So yeah. before you talk about incubation period, okay. you must establish the fact that an exposure has taken place. Okay. An exposure in the sense that somebody has uh, breathed in or inhaled infected droplets, droplets okay. or may have touched a contaminated surface, surface and put it in a nose okay. or your mouth. Okay. So, and, and, and thereby introducing the virus into the body. Okay. So it um, generally takes between two to 14 days okay. after the exposure, okay. right, for the um, exposed Is that the reason why they said we should isolate, anybody that has contact should isolate for 14 days? Is yes, that, is that so the that's, the, yeah, that's the, um, that is the principle behind it, okay. because um, if you've had an exposure, okay. right, and um, you do not know for sure if that exposure has led to an infection. So an exposure is one thing. Okay. An exposure may or may not lead to an infection. Some people get exposed, but they don't get infected. Okay. So uh, as a precautionary measure, since okay. you do not know uh, whether you may have been infected or not as a result of the exposure, okay. the advice is that within that two to 14 day period, okay. uh, isolate yourself so that you do not end up exposing other people to, to the virus so okay. that you may not even have confirmed that you have in the first place. Okay. So in terms of the symptoms, um, first of all, I must seize this opportunity to establish that uh, you know we learn more about this disease uh, because, it's still yeah, because it's still new okay. I mean, compared to other conditions we've lived with for many years. Yes, okay. Um, before December uh, last year, 2019, nobody we, knew about this condition. Sure. You know, but in the period uh, that we've had time to study this virus, okay. um, we we know for sure uh, that um, you know the majority of persons who get infected may or may not may are likely to develop uh, either mild symptoms or may not be symptomatic at all. Okay. I mean, up to 80%, perhaps up to 50% of people uh, may not be symptomatic. Um, then, but cumulatively, up to 80% of people may either be mildly symptomatic or asymptomatic. Okay. And so, with respect to uh, uh, the symptoms, symptoms in question, yeah, yeah. so the, the common ones, the very, very common ones, which uh, it's almost defined in most people will, who develop symptoms will. will, will exhibits these ones and these okay. are fever and cough okay you know fever low grade moderate high grade and, and cough um, there's also um, other uh, conditions like um, runny nose okay. um, you also have generalized body body aches okay. um, for some people uh, what the reports is a loss of tastes okay a loss of smell Okay. Uh, some for some people they could they could have some you know like skin reaction or uh, okay. changes on their on their skin. Okay. Uh, for some people it could be gastrointestinal tract. So uh, 
uh, the symptoms somebody exhibits a function of which part of the body is infected. The commonness is the respiratory tract, but sometimes it also affects the gastrointestinal tract, in which case the person could have uh, diarrhea, uh, uh, could have, uh, which is passing of frequency, so we could also have other GI symptoms like abdominal ache, abdominal cramps. Uh, sometimes, if it's the eyes that is infected, there could be redness of the eyes, okay. or otherwise called conjunctivitis. Okay. And uh, so these are the commonest symptoms. Yeah. However, for people who have uh, the affectation of the respiratory tracts, which would initially manifest as fever and cough, okay. it could also progress to having difficulty in, in breathing. breathing. When uh, difficulty in breathing uh, is an indication of the severity or the condition. condition okay. So if, if that sets in then it becomes an emergency, it has to be dealt with very, very promptly because okay. um, if not done so it could progress and lead to, to death. Uh, but those are the common symptoms. So what like from what you just explained now, yeah. malaria is almost having something so how can we differentiate when one is having malaria? and when one is really having the symptom because they are almost having yes. something similar. Yeah, I, I do agree with you that there's certainly some overlap. Um, malaria is um, more often than not symptomatic. I mean, the, you, you cannot talk about malaria without certain symptoms. In the case of COVID-19, um, it's possible to have it and become and be asymptomatic. That's on the one hand. But uh, then again, in terms of the overlap of the symptoms, for example, one that 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 comes out clearly is fever, which okay. is very defining in malaria, malaria yeah, yeah. and also quite defining in COVID. COVID yeah. uh, the nature and pattern of the fever is different. Okay. You know, malaria usually has um, uh, intermittent uh, fever okay. in terms of the, the pattern. Um, and in the case of COVID, for those people for whom the fever is defining. You know, the fever is likely to be, you know, sustained over a period of, and only uh, occasional spikes, but largely sustained, you know, over the, the, the period of infection. Uh, in the case of malaria, it's, 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 um, it's, it's intermittent. Secondly, um, not everyone who has malaria, you know, uh, has affectation of the respiratory tract system. Sometimes people have a combination of malaria and an upper respiratory tract infection from another cause, which put together <laughs> will really make it resemble COVID-19. But ordinarily, you wouldn't expect um, upper respiratory tract infection in malaria. Okay. So, um, but I do agree with you that there's a lot of yeah, similarities yeah, in, in, the, in, really in the symptoms. Out, yeah. And that's why, unfortunately, quite a number of people who may be currently infected with COVID-19. They think they have malaria. They think they have malaria okay. and may be managing themselves, you know, as though they had malaria when indeed uh, they should be following a different line of management. And that's why it's very important, uh, based on the guidelines that NCDC has released, that anyone who is exhibiting such symptoms should take necessary steps to have a COVID-19 test. And it's becoming increasingly uh, easier and more accessible to have this test done. And so the only way that can definitely tell whether it's malaria or, or COVID-19 is, is to take a test. Okay, that, yeah. that brings me to my next question. How is COVID-19 diagnosed? Okay, yeah. so there are quite a, a number of uh, diagnostic approaches to, okay. to COVID-19 and every country uh, gives approval for the method okay. that, that they would use. But broadly speaking, uh, COVID-19 can be tested either uh, by checking for the antigen of the virus that is, in this case, coronavirus, okay. you know, in, um, in a specimen, either it's a blood specimen or a, a, a specimen from nasal secretions or from, you know, secretions from the airway, okay. right? Uh, so that's, that's one way. Okay. Uh, another way is by testing for the antibodies Okay. You know, generally, if an, if there's a foreign substance like a virus in the body, okay. the body produces a response mechanism which leads to the production of specific antibodies okay. to the antigen of that virus. Okay. And the antibody detection can be in an indirect way of diagnosing the fact that there is an antigen, you know, of 
that, that is provoking the antibody response. Okay. Uh, now, in terms of um, what is being prescribed, the antigen test using um, a method we call DNA uh, polymerase chain reaction. Okay. You know, simply put, it's a way of, of really being able to demonstrate okay. the presence of the virus yes. in the body, okay. you know, uh, through a method. And uh, currently in the country, there are well over 60 laboratories wow. that are accredited to carry out these tests. Okay. Um, and essentially, the samples are collected from either nasal secretions or from throat swabs, uh, believing that um, uh, after, typically after 24 hours or 48 hours after uh, an infection has occurred, okay. you know, because of the affinity that the virus has for the respiratory tract, okay, there will okay. be presence of the virus okay. in nasal secretions okay. and also secretions from the respiratory tract okay. in quantities that are able to be collected through, uh, the, you know, sample collection swab, okay. and uh, can be, you know, the virus can be isolated and and, and, and definitely, you know, detected. As, as present in, in the sample. Okay. Um, now the other method, the antibody test, is, is typically not very reliable because the uh, presence of antibodies uh, in a specimen, blood specimen, may not demonstrate active infection. Don't forget that after some time, the antigen clears out, but the antibodies will remain and can mm -hmm. still be detected in an antibody test. Okay. And that is why you know the authorities are pushing for um, uh, for, for as a country, we stick to the approved method, method okay. of molecular testing using the DNA PCR method okay. that demonstrates the presence of the antigen okay. to the virus in the body. Yeah. So thank you, doctor, for um, the enlightenment. I, I, I believe that we are all learning gradually. The truth about the virus is getting out gradually. So, um, what is the risk? Who is at risk of developing severe illness? <laughs> okay, first of all, everybody, you know, is at but, risk. But, but there yeah. is this saying yeah. that those yeah. who are yeah. 60 and above yes, I'll get should there. not... I'll um, get, okay. Yeah, I'll get there. So, just to say that, you know, everybody is at risk of okay. an infection. Anybody who, who is exposed to the condition. Because we, the, of, the youth today now, they, they are not taking um, yes, precautions because seriously. they believe that um, they are still... Able yes. to uh, on, 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 unfortunately, that's misleading, and uh, those were some of the myths that existed in the past. Okay. Uh, now we know better. You know, when it started, considering the fact that it started in the Middle East as the first epicenter, so it started in China, China in, the, yeah. in, in Asia, okay. Southeast Asia, uh, as the first epicenter, and uh, gradually it moved to the Middle East, and also Iran became a hotspot, and then we heard of. Uh, Spain, Italy. France, Italy yeah. at one point were the hotspots in Europe. Yeah. Then it's then of course the UK as well, yeah. you know, and then it moved to the US as a major hotspot now. Uh, and it's been in Africa, uh, but certainly not at the proportion it's been in those countries. And that has led people to think uh, that uh, maybe perhaps certain persons from certain ways are maybe at a lower risk. So everybody is at risk okay. of, of the infection. Anybody who gets exposed to the infected respiratory droplets or, uh, or, or, or touches the surface and, and, and contaminates okay. their airway. Okay. However, like I mentioned, um, we know for sure that 80% okay. of the persons who get exposed are likely to experience no symptoms or mild no symptoms. symptoms okay. right? uh, Another, the other twenty percent okay. are the ones who would experience likely to experience very severe symptoms, okay. and uh, five percent out of that twenty percent, or rather five percent generally, uh, which is a subset of that twenty percent, uh, are the ones who would, like, really experience very very severe yeah. severe yeah. illness that might compromise their airway, make it difficult for them to breathe without uh, external support, you know, through oxygen, oxygen or through. Yeah. The use of uh, ventilators, okay. and uh, it's within this subset that sadly the mortality is recorded. Okay. And uh, currently, you know, the mortality rates varies from some countries to the others. Okay. Some countries that currently have a mortality rate as much as ten percent, okay. whilst others have much lower. In Nigeria today, the mortality case fatality rates 
you know, it hovers around 2.2-2.3 percent. Now, what we know is that the group of people who are likely to fall into that 20 percent that experience uh, severity of their of okay. the condition are people who are elderly, okay. you know, people who are 65 years above. and above. And also people, regardless of their age, who have some pre-existing health conditions. And the commonest that we have been able to show are people who have a 